The F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Season 8 of F and Rad is sponsored by Wired Snowboards and On Optics, The Boardroom Snowboard Shop, Find an Epic Agent.com, and Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, BC. This real estate secret could save you thousands. Never contact a realtor yourself. Instead, have Find an Epic Agent refer you to proven local realtors. Why? We pay you from the commission the realtor pays Find an Epic Agent for your introduction. You get the best real estate agent working for you, and we put your money back in your pocket. In over 30 countries, Find an Epic Agent makes it cheaper to buy or sell a home. That's why it pays to click findanepicagent.com before contacting a realtor. Support also comes from DeKine, Grouse Mountain, Mount Seymour, Pro Standard GoPro Accessories, and Volcom Outerwear. We've got 500 subscribers. Now we need 500 more by the end of the year. Only a couple episodes left to do it. If you got the chance, just pause the show right now and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks. If you'd like to win 1910 clothing or beneath underwear, pause the show, go to the F and Rad YouTube channel and comment 1910 rocks or beneath apparel rules or both if you want both. I'll be sending out prize packs every week until the end of the season. Extra special thanks this episode to Tomahawk Indigenous Products and be sure to check out Kaya J and the Drink Tickets new album, Better. Jim Rippey had the best-selling pro model in the world for seven years during my favorite era, the early 90s. As a top Burton pro, he filmed with Standard and MacDog, and his parts were always highly anticipated every year. He's a world champion, a U.S. Open champion, a three-times Vans Triple Crown champion, an Innsbruck Aaron Style champion, and he's won countless other titles. Jim's the first guy to backflip on a snowmobile on film. And as his career was winding down, he became a chaplain at the X Games. Jim is one of those pro snowboarders that fell off the map and left everybody wondering, where did he wind up? So in this conversation, we catch up with Jim and go deep into his snowboarding roots. It's neat when you are passionate about passionate about something and you know your passion is what moves you to, to want to succeed and, and uh, make those sacrifices it takes to succeed and and just live it you know and and uh that was a real special um my career lasted 14 years so um but it went by like a blink of the eye yeah um i tell people that when you live seasonally and you're chasing the snow Mm -hmm. and you're traveling quite a bit it just makes life go really fast Uh, Sometimes in life where you stay in the same location and you really don't travel at all, life can start to drag a little bit. Well, that 14 years just flew by. Um, (laughs) It seemed like about half that time. Maybe it seemed like seven years or so. Yeah, this is kind of a bizarre way to start. And I try not to speak too much. Anyways, the stories that we read our children, right? Like I do a little bit of stand up and I I've, I looked at Jack and the Beanstalk and I thought, what is this story? It's essentially a story of a murdering thief kid that went up a beanstalk to his neighbor's house, stole his good stuff, and cut the thing down and killed him and everyone like applauded. Like I'm like, this is a horrible story this for kids. Up. <laughs> but it's actually a te- like over 10,000 year story. And it's exactly what you were just speaking of. It's a story about if you stay with your parents, it's speaking a metaphor. So if you stay with your parents, then you starve. You starve for knowledge, you starve for progression. So you do what your parents do and nothing changes. But if you go out in the world to the market to sell a cow or whatever, and you come back to your parents with the magic beans of like, I'm gonna go travel and see the world. And then they throw the beans out the window like, no way you're doing that, which makes the fire in your heart grow more. So then you go out and you follow that trail and you meet the wonders of the, uh, you see the wonders of travel in the world and you bring that gold back to your parents. So there's going to be giants to slay. There's going to be things that are scary. It's going to be climbing into the clouds on a beanstalk. It's going to be taking a ship somewhere or some crazy thing. 
So it's the call to adventure. And when you come back, it's the hero's journey. That's what it is. And you did the hero's journey when you were a kid. You're like, Dad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go work at a ski resort because I've caught this snowboard bug. Yeah. And I don't know if your dad was like, don't do it. <laughs> He's like, go to school. Or if he was like, you know what? Yeah, go, go for it. I wasn't much of a student. So my dad's an English teacher mm -hmm. and he's got his master's degree. Yeah. Um, when, if, if kids would finish their, their uh, work for the day, he would pr play Scrabble with them. Cool. And so my dad had a huge vocabulary and uh, was kind of like Cliff Clavin that we spoke about earlier. Yeah. I know some people won't know that analogy of Cliff uh, Clavin because they well. didn't watch Cheers. Sure, I didn't watch sure. Cheers a lot either, but like <laughs> I did see it a few times. Yeah. And yeah. Cliff Clavin, my dad in his later years started to remind me of Cliff Clavin because he'd throw out these random facts. But nonetheless... Uh, so my dad was, was scholarly. I didn't get that gene. <laughs> I was not that great at school. Um, I actually had a few classes a day that I had to go to special education. Yeah, um, I think it was math and, and spelling. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm still a horrible speller and it's just so ironic mm -hmm. how, you know, here's my dad, Scrabble champion, huge vocabulary. Um, and I just didn't get that. So my dad saw that uh, you know, if I went on to junior college, it was going to be to play football because I liked sports and was, was pretty good at sports. Um, but he also would tell me, you know, Jim, if you don't know what you want to do, I would suggest you go into the military. My dad fought in World War II, wow. didn't have me until he was 49 years old. Wow. My grandfather fought in World War I. So, you know, people that are from the Great Depression, it's a different era, oh, yeah. right? And, and they know a lot of things that we don't really understand. You know, uh, you and I have been extremely blessed to grow up in a country where we haven't had to face a world war, right. you know, and hopefully we never do. Yeah. So my plan leaving high school was to try to get in the NFL as a punter. Right? Wow. I was good at kicking a football. Yeah. So, um, I went to a college down in Santa Cruz and right before our first game, I ended up leaving because they didn't have a, a great football program. And I just was like, this isn't the right place. They wouldn't just let me practice special teams. They wanted me to play a normal position too. And I was like, no, I'm not gonna make it in the NFL as a, a free safety or, or a, a cornerback. It's just, I'm not fast enough. I just don't have the athleticism to, to do that but I can kick a football. And so I just want to kick a football. And they were like, no, you can't do that. You got to play a regular position. Wow. So I split right before our first game. I'd gone down to Butte College where Aaron Rodgers actually played. Cool. It's very interesting. Aaron Rodgers has had a great career in the NFL. I don't know if you watch football at all. I don't. He's okay. So he, he's had a, a great career and he went to this little junior college, community college cool. called Butte College down near Chico. Brad. And so I went there and looked at it and was like, okay, this is where I'm going to go. Came back to Quincy and then ended up going with a buddy of mine who snowboarded. He was the only guy in my town who snowboarded. And he said, hey, you know, what are you doing this summer? I'm like, oh, I'm not sure or this winter. And uh, I said, I'm not sure. I'm working at Round Table Pizza right now and I hate it. My <laughs> boss is a jerk. And he goes, why don't you come to Tahoe with me? And, and work as a lift operator. And I was like, well, what do you do? And he goes, you don't do anything. You just hang out. Like you, you know, you might shovel a little bit, you might set up, you know, some posts where people are not supposed to go. And, and uh, you basically help people get on the chairlift or get off the chairlift. But most of the time everyone does that themselves. So you really don't have to do too much except for keep your ramp nice. And then you just, you know, you're gonna get a free pass and you're gonna get a discount on your, on your food. And, nice. and you can live in the annex for really cheap. So your rent's cheap, your food's cheap. And you, whenever you're not working, you can be snowboarding or skiing. And um, I skied at the time. And so I remember my first night, it was called, uh, it was the orientation night at, at Donner Ski Ranch. And they had one chairlift open and they had the light shining on it. And I remember seeing a couple guys come down and, and snowboarding. And it just looked so fluid and, and flowy and it looked like surfing and skating on snow. And uh, I was like, wow, that looks really cool. Like I'd seen my friend Brad make some turns and yeah. same, same thought popped into my head. Cool. Like, wow, that looks really fluid. 
Yeah. Different than skiing, where skiing, when someone's skiing, you can tell they're trying to yes. ski. Whereas yeah. in snowboarding, yeah. it's just like, it just looks nice. It looks fun. Yeah. You know? So yes. um, ran it aboard my first night there and went out and took a bunch of slams, took, took some nice <laughs> heelside edge catches oh, and, yeah. you know, woke up the next day pretty sore. Didn't really have anyone telling me how to do it, what to watch out for. Um, didn't take a lesson, just kind of went for it on a, on, a, on a run that was steeper than I should have been on my first run. Next day, went to Boreal. And then by the end of that second session, it clicked. And it was just like, wow, this is so cool. Like when you can go from your heel side to flat base to toe side to flat base to, and you start to do it, right? Yeah. You start to yeah. turn, you're like, this is cool. This is really cool. Yeah. And then the progression is just so much quicker than skiing. One of the things that I noticed is, well, first of all, I wasn't just a weekend warrior anymore where I could get one day here, one day there with the ski program at Quincy. Um, my dad used to drive the equipment truck. So, oh, I would, right. you know, during the winter, you know, I'd get a handful of days in, maybe seven or eight days in during the winter, I, I would guess. And it was just one day here, one day there. And now... I'm living at a ski area. Now <laughs> I can go ride seven days a week if I want to. Yeah, right? they had night skiing at Donner as N well? Well, I don't know that they were running nights at Donner then, th but at Boreal, just at Boreal, over the hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. was where they would have night boarding. So Rad. if I worked during the day, I would go ride during the night. Yeah. So it was just every day I was on the snow all the time. Amazing. And when you can do that, you can get really good fast. So literally after like a month of doing it, <laughs> I was like, you know, learning tricks and getting good at it. And uh, and um, so that's kind of how it all how it all started going. That's incredible. Doesn't the Burton team show up and you're just like a lifty guy and you're looking at them going, mm, that's a, a, attainable. Like they're riding at a pretty high level. I could see that, but not so far from where I'm at. Actually, you know what? I think maybe you even told it like, these guys aren't as good as I am. <laughs> I'm riding every day. Here comes the Burton team that's the best in the world, right? My mindset wasn't that okay. necessarily. Okay. It was just kind of like, wow, look at these guys yeah. making a living yeah. as snowboarders. I didn't even know that existed, you know? And so that just put the seed in my brain of like, wow, if I can keep progressing... Who knows? Maybe I could do that. Right. And uh, it was such a blessing to be able to see, like I'd be sitting there working chair one at, at Donner Ski Ranch. Yep. And it'd be like Craig Kelly getting on the chair <laughs> and Jason Ford. Wow. Keith Wallace. Right. Um, Nicole Angelrath. Jacoby. Uh, Jacoby. Uh, Davis. Um, oh, wow. Just like all of those guys andy coglin yeah brad so i mean i don't know if you ever got to see craig back in the day but he was an odd looking guy he used to have this this goatee and it would like <laughs> it was long he almost looked like an egyptian statue sure and so he would come up and get on the chair and i just remember thinking like man he's a peculiar looking dude <laughs> but you know he was the man it's like that's craig kelly yeah you know that's yeah. that's like a world champion yes so and he was always friendly everyone on the team was friendly um, another guy that was on the team was Jimmy Scott. Oh, I he love was on, it. So Jimmy Scott, Jeff Davis, um, Keith Wallace, Jason Ford, uh, Andy Coughlin, um, you know, just that team right That's then the was whole, just yeah. iconic, right? Yeah. And so that was what I noticed was this. Burton was taking over the industry because when you looked at the equipment that they were on, the outerwear that they were wearing, I was like, this is a legit company. And so that's what got me going like, okay, if I'm gonna try to pursue this, I wanna pursue it with Burton because they're the biggest company in the world. And yeah, you had, you know, these other companies, but it was it was everyone who was like in second place as far as just the size of their team, the money and resources behind it. And so it was kind of a no brainer for me. Like, you know, you always have your Burton haters. Sure. People who are just like, I would never ride for Burton. They're too corporate and this, that, or what whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, you know what? Like they have a legit team and they're traveling the world and they're like pushing the sport. And so if you're going to hate on that, whatever, hate on it. Like, I don't really care. I think the hate <laughs> started maybe a little after that team. I think it was, it was hard. It was hard to not admire 
what was going on. Thank you very much. You're welcome. What was going on with Burton? I've I've gone to the uh, to the archives, and as you know, Jake was keeping one of absolutely everything. Usually, it'd be his outfit from the year. Like he would pick something and and ride it. And actually, that's not true because, yeah, he would try everything. Yeah, so he's got like one of absolutely everything they ever made. Nice. In this huge warehouse. Very cool. Their catalog, you watch when you look at the history of Burton, the catalog goes, you know, one board, two boards. I'll get three, three boards the next year. Five boards. <laughs> Eight boards and gloves and jackets mm-hmm. and boots. And like their catalog grew with snowboarding. Yeah. They were such a dominant company that, yeah, yeah, people started to hate on them for sure once there was alternatives. But at that point, that team you're talking about, if you wanted to be on the best stuff, there wasn't really an alternative at that point. Yeah, no doubt. Jeff Brushy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was Brushy? trying to think, like, there's the other names I'm totally forgetting, yeah, but yeah. Brushy was a hero of mine. You know, watching him ride was always fun. He had a neat style. Yeah. Um, very cool. Yeah, he was, he, yeah. Jason Ford, too. Jason Ford was sick. Yeah. Yeah, he was a, a really good rider. Um, uh, Noah Brandon, Noah Brandon was, was, was on, an excellent yeah, rider. Yeah. I, I remember, so like I said, I worked at Donner Ski Ranch my first year. Then I moved to Boreal, and I worked at night as a night lift operator. So you could ride and, during so the I'd day. So I ride during the day, nice. and so those guys would come over and ride during the night. Yeah. And so I'd get to watch them ride and, you know, watching Jason Ford and some of these other guys ride with uh, coming from the East Coast, too. So they're used to riding on ice. Noah Brandon from the East Coast, too. Yep. Um, excellent edge control. Um, very precise in doing their tricks. You know, maybe they would do a half cab. Like I remember like Jason Ford doing like, I mean... I'm just kind of pulling this from like clouds in my head, but like, you know, doing half cabs and like taking, grabbing stale fish and and tweaking it or, or doing a front side 180, doing a melon and tweaking it and just little nuances that were dope. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know? And so you see that and then that gets your brain going of things that you want to do. And that's the great thing about snowboarding is if you can imagine it, you can do it. That's where it starts is you thinking about doing a trick and you start thinking about how you'd want that to look. And that's another reason it's so great watching videos because you watch these videos and literally you're sleeping thinking about these tricks and you wake up and you're like, you know, it's a nice day and you're like, oh, game on. I'm going to try these tricks. And it's just like the progression in snowboarding is such a neat thing. Yeah, it's more difficult for kids these days to understand what an old man thing to say. But the 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 idea it's like basketball. I had that thought at the beginning of the year. It's like the, at some point, people were learning the basics of basketball, the layup or the jump shot or whatever. We were at that moment in snowboarding. So now we're at a point where for a kid, snowboarding is like what basketball was for us when we were kids. You know what I mean? Like it, it was these guys a million years ago with duct tape and boards that broke. Like, these are things that kids get comfortable boots when they're six. They get all the gear is, you know, waterproof and designed properly. You know, I was with my buddy. His jacket broke off of him. It was too cold for the material, and the material failed. (laughs) Yeah. Being a part of those people in that beginning era. And like you say, you look at this and, and realize, oh, these guys are making a living doing this? Yeah. Well, nobody had ever done it before making money. Before Craig, nobody had really secured a, a, a salary that was like, I'm going to live like someone who went to school and got a professional job. Yeah. You could live on 500 bucks a month, which <laughs> it went a long way back then. Yeah. But you were probably living in somebody's basement, whereas Craig could buy a house with his salary probably at the time that you saw him there. Yeah. Yeah. So you must get hooked up by a rep or something. Or you talk to these guys and... My first connection was seeing a rep yep. at Donner Ski Ranch. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that you notice when you first get into snowboarding is you kind of geek out on gear. Absolutely. So you're on a chairlift and you're looking at what someone's, what they're wearing and what they're riding. Mm-hmm. And so I ran into Laurent... Laurent Vrignon, he is a French guy who was into windsurfing. 
And then when Burton started making equipment, he saw a new sport that he thought was going to blow up and he started repping Burton. So he was like the first, I think, California rep for cool. Burton. So I was waiting in line to get some food at Donner Ski Ranch and I look over and I see this guy wearing, you know, head to toe Burton. And I was like, hey, do you ride for Burton? And he goes, no, I'm a rep for Burton. And just the bell went off in my head of like, okay, if I want to try to impress somebody, it's this guy. Let's go ride with him. You know, like, yeah, you, you yeah. know, your brain thinks like that. Like I was a competitive person, still am a competitive person. And if you're trying to make it in a sport and you see the guy yeah. who can help you do <laughs> yeah. that, you're obviously yeah. going to be like, what's up, bro? Like, let's go ride. You yes. know what I mean? Yes. Like, and I, I wasn't shy. And so I just started talking to him, went riding with him showed off a little bit you know i mean back then it was like you know doing 360s 540s maybe a 720 and a backflip kind of like that yeah here's you know here's what i can do but the first time i ever saw someone do a backflip on skis it blew my mind yeah like for someone to hit a big jump and lay out a backflip right in front of you when you've never seen that live yeah you're like that's sick and so even though this guy's a rep like he's seen some stuff, but like you go bust something big, he's still gonna be impressed, right? Yeah. Totally. So like I went and like just did everything I could, and then at the end of the day, I asked him, uh, "What would I need to do to get sponsored?" And he said, "Well, go enter some contests, and then uh, if you get some results, he's like that's the typical way of doing it is do some contests. Um, after you get some results, come see me at the end of the year, and we'll see if you see how you do." So I had three firsts and a third my first year. Oh, wow. And uh, came back to him and said, I got three firsts and a third, won my first contest. And he goes, okay, um, here's what I'm gonna do for you. Uh, next year, I'm gonna loan you a board for the season. And I'm gonna uh, loan you a board and bindings. And then I'm gonna get you pro form on uh, your clothing, boots, gloves, etc." Yeah. And I was like, awesome. So I remember calling my dad and saying, hey dad, I think I wanna put off college for a year because I think I might have a chance of making it as a snowboarder, as a professional snowboarder. And he was like, well, that, that's great, you know? Cause cool. he was behind whatever I was gonna to try to do. I mean, yeah, good. You know, I, like I said, I didn't have a promising career waiting for me after high school because I wasn't much of a student. You know, I got C, C average so I could play sports and that was, that was about it. Yeah. So. Laurent was my first hookup. That's amazing. Yeah. And I, you know what? I saw him two days ago. No. At the California International Marathon. I drove down there because I had I, I had new two buddies that were doing it. Him. Yeah. And then my neighbor over here, like I mentioned earlier. Oh, uh, that's And so I, I'm standing at mile six. Yeah. Now there's 10,000 people running. <laughs> and I, I picked out Laurent. Like I picked out, like they'll have different groups running yeah. with like, say you want to finish it in three hours. Yeah. There'll be someone holding a little sign that says three hours and a pack of people will run with that guy. He's a pacer. Oh, and wow. so I knew like Laurent's an incredible marathon runner and uh, has competed in Boston, Chicago, all, a lot of the majors. Wow. And he's extremely quick. His fastest marathon's two hours and 55 minutes at Chicago. Oof. So he's like, Whoa. no joke. He's legit. Yeah. So right around the three hour mark, I just started looking for him. And and uh, sure enough, here he comes. I'm like, Laurent. <laughs> and he's like, Jim. And so I was like, great job, buddy. Keep it up, you know? And then he runs by, he just texted me today and said, thank you so much for coming and cheering me on. So hopefully next year I'll get to run it with him. This year I was gonna run it, but I got it, had an injury, so I haven't been able to run for about three months. Oh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's but, all good. It but, happens. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible that you guys have stayed friends over these years. Mm -hmm. Like Facebook. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there you go. There's a Burton rep in BC, Martino, and he's not the rep anymore, but I mean, he brought up so many people that his name comes up a lot. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, and again, I worked at a shop that didn't have Burton, so that's where the kind of Burton hate, I think, started when there was like enough stuff out there that you could kind of ride, you could totally ride something else that wasn't Burton, and you could say, oh yeah, Burton's fall apart, or you could, you know what I mean? Like you could, there were options, and that was when you had a pro model on Burton, because the industry, doubles doubles and doubles you know three years of 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 doubling and and you've got like 
legitimate players out there giving Burton a run for their money on certain certain things for sure. Yeah. You're right on the cusp of that like skate style. And you had a really unique style. I would I would say you were kind of the first jock mega pro. Like where you you had a very athletic background. It almost looked like you would train weights or something to be like to do the stuff whereas like at that time there were movies of guys that were training by blacking out, you know, and blacking out drunk, blacking out drunk, right? Hitting, yeah. hitting beer bottles on their heads and seeing if they can break them. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. That was happening Whiskey. at the same time, right? Like so, you, you were a great face for Burton. Like they made the right call. Like when when they put you in a backcountry freestyle situation, you got the shots. Even though you were riding such a small board for the time. That was insane. Yeah, like a one, what was it? A 154. 54. So, yeah, and you're six that, feet tall, six one? Six foot. <laughs> yeah, that was my first pro model was a 154. Yep. 154 twin tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the things you were doing, you know, the backflip, like you, the, all those tricks you just mentioned, like you, you were crushing it. Did you partner up with a with a photographer like did you have someone that you shot with on a consistent basis most of the time you're trying to kill two birds with one stone so a photographer will follow a filmer okay because if a if an athlete is going to go out and like really try to go big and risk getting hurt yep you want to get both shots <laughs> hell yeah right yeah so let's yeah. have you know maybe two photographers yep. each in a different angle and then a filmer who might have an extra guy with him too. So you get two angles on different big stuff. That way, if you get the shot, it's, it's, it's gonna be there and you're gonna have it. Um, Cause sometimes you'll do something and it's filmed from a certain angle that really doesn't show off the jump or whatever, or the cliff. Totally. But from another angle, you get to see it the way that it should be seen. And um, so yeah, most of the photographers just hung around with the filmers and followed them around. Yeah. You know, every once in a while, like in my early career, to have a day where you could hook up with a, a known photographer. Yeah. You know. Who would that have been? Well, just one of the guys that like worked for the magazines. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so if you could hook up with one of those guys and, and go out and just focus. And then your, your focus would be different because for a photograph, typically, you know, you just got to make it look pretty in the air. Yes. And so for filming, it's got to be pretty all the way. The takeoff's got to be right. You're not waving your arms in the air. I mean, sometimes there's no other choice because, yep. you know, you're, you're doing what you have to do to land back on your feet. But um, filming's the ultimate because you can't get away with something being ugly. Yeah. If it's ugly, it doesn't make it in the movie. Yeah, you can get lucky shots with a with a photographer with a still yeah. for sure, and lots of cover shots have been, you know, while people are hitting a big jump, the photographers kind of trying to stay warm. They're hiking around, looking around, and going, "Hey, you know what? If you came towards me, yeah, off of this thing." And then the guy goes, I'm not doing that. It's landing flat. It's like, well, no, but this, okay, let's put a pile of snow. It's just a really nice shot, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's more how the photography thing yes. seems to go yeah. from time to time. Absolutely. Whereas the filming, like, and you were filming with the hatchets, right? Like those guys are just, I go back and watch those TV series movies. Mm -hmm. And by today's standards, that stuff is still good. It's you're, crazy. You're right. You're right. I saw some, some footage the other day. Yeah. And there were shots in there that were next level. Yeah. But there were a lot of shots in there that just wouldn't even have made the cut back then because our our credo was like, you got to go big. Oh, yeah. You can't just do a 540, you know, five feet off the ground and go 30 feet. That's right. not going to make the cut. You need, and I remember Mac Dog always used to say, like, you got to go big, man, go big. It's going <laughs> to, you know, if you don't go big, it doesn't matter. And, and he would like critique stuff. And, you know, critiquing is like one of those things that you're constantly doing when you're a professional snowboarder because you're kind of like trying to figure out what you want to do. And um, a lot of stuff hits the floor. And so it's just like, but anyway, getting back to like what, even watching a modern movie a lot of that stuff was like small and I was just thinking, gosh, you know, that's, that, 
it's too small. Wouldn't have you know? flown. Yeah, yeah just because yeah. you did a 540 or you did a 720 or a 900 on that little hip right there, it wasn't very big, you know. And but that's okay, you know, that's fine. Sure. But so like, remember movies like RPM and some of the early fall line movies. Back then, you know, if you did a 900 on a hip. It didn't have to be huge because you're doing a 900. Yes. How many people were yes. doing a 900 yeah. back then? But nowadays, you know, everyone and their mom can do a 900 in their sleep, right? Yeah. So it's got to be big. So like I always am kind of like, wow, I'm surprised that made it in that movie. But like I said, there are a bunch of shots in there where you can see that progression where guys are doing things that are beautiful, you know, where you watch somebody stick something that you're just like, Yes. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I'll just be sitting there by myself watching. I'm like, yes, you know, and I just <laughs> yeah, get amped totally. like you're watching a sporting event. Yes. I, that's exact. That that's what my my sport was. I, I don't know how it happened, but I just never got into anything organized. I started skateboarding and then I started snowboarding and I basically didn't pick any other sports. I just put it all into that, which was you know, yeah, for me to watch a movie in those days, especially would be the equivalent of somebody watching, you know, the NHL Stanley Cup final game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. Like it was like, this is what is at the cutting edge of progression. Now, that's the big takeaway. I think nowadays to, to be a sponsored snowboarder, and I don't think this is wrong. and I don't think it's bad. You don't have to be the tip of the spear anymore. You just have to be a really good snowboarder that shows up for work, gets your shots, and, you know, there is no Mac Dog movie anymore, right? So if yeah. Patagonia is your sponsor, Patagonia is going to send you places, and you just need to get shots that are nice to look at, right? You don't, you need, you don't need to go do the biggest thing that's ever been done, but during your era... If you didn't do the biggest thing that's ever been done or something that's never been done, it's getting cut from the movie. It's it just, I mean, sure, you could make a nice turn if you want, but you're wasting film because yeah. that nice turns, unless it's down something super gnarly, you know, by the time Johan's TB5 thing, it's like you've got to, now you have to add freestyle tricks at full speed in a line. Like, there's no more... <laughs> there's no more just pretty turns you yeah. know what I mean mm -hmm. and there were some guys in those early TV movies and in the fall line films you know when they would do the extreme sections sometimes we would fast forward those all the time I would fast forward those really? and now when I go back and watch how gnarly that shit You're, was you appreciate it so much more hmm. so much more that's cool yeah yeah so your era was like the golden era well it was just neat because you had basically um all styles of snowboarding trying to represent themselves so like mac dog for instance like you know he was into skate style and then you had the hatchets who are into big mountain and so that them coming together and filming what they thought was the gnarliest just made the perfect match right it was the perfect dance and like oh, yeah. you can still look at those old tv movies and they're fun to watch and the music kicks ass and and uh it's solid writing and, and pushing pushing the sport a hundred percent yeah it's very Super neat. Yeah, you know? fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah, both those guys came at it with that, yeah. And, and you can't forget critique. Fall Line Film. No, you uh, can't. Fall Line Films. Right, because right, right. they were the first ones who really started shooting 16 millimeter film mm -hmm. and taking it to that next level. So, you know, when you saw snowboarding filmed with 16 millimeter film, it was special. Mm -hmm. It wasn't ghetto, um, you know, like the old video cameras that were just ghetto, you know, it yeah. was like film like you'd see in a movie. So yeah. watch snowboarding in that format and then hit, having the narration like Jerry Dugan used to do. Yeah. And, you know, they would travel and they would turn it into a story kind of like, uh, um, what's the ski guy? Um, Warren Miller. Warren Miller. Yeah. You know, turn it into a story. Tell a story. Yeah. And, and then it, even at that point in skiing, there was... Um, like Blizzard of Oz, the guy who did yes. Blizzard of Oz yeah. with Glenn Plake. And like, I would watch that stuff. That was Matchstick, right? Yeah, I think so. Was with it? never having, it's a guy out of Calgary, I think. With never having skied, but being so into just the mountain, watching the way that Scott and uh, Glenn Plake skied. It was like, okay, this is what snowboarding needs to be like too. 
Yeah. And then the, uh, as soon as the Fall Line Film stuff comes out, that's probably pretty close together. Is like Snowboarders in Exile and Blizzard of Oz. They've got to be around the same time, maybe a year or two apart. Yeah. All of a right. sudden, it was like, oh, man, this is incredible. Yeah, game Let, on. Game on. That's it. Yeah, it was kind of a bummer that, you know, towards the end, Fall Line Films had been such a major player. It was kind of like there were three guys. There was... Jerry Nardi, you know, Standard, and Mac Dog. Yep. And then as those guys took off, and then uh, again, this exponential thing, where then you've got the whiskey videos, and you've got all sorts of chaos. you got Mouse, and you've got regional videos. There, I remember there were like 100 videos, probably 94, 95, sometime around then. You could literally watch 100 videos. Whereas before that... It was, you know, three a year or something. Yeah. 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 Who were your favorites to, to film with? You filmed with Mac Dog as well? Yeah. I, tr I tried to film a little bit with Mac Dog and then film with Standard. Yeah. Um, I kind of liked the, like, I loved Mac Dog's videos, but if I was going to have a choice, I'd probably film with Standard just because I like the 16 millimeter film and the way, it, the way that, uh, you know, they'd go to Alaska every year, and I really liked the big mountains and riding stuff like that um, more than park. You know, yeah, park's yeah. cool for a little bit, but I kind of get burnt on it. You know, <laughs> it's just kind of like, eh. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, I film more with standard films than than with Mac Dog. But so, I love Mac. I I I love uh, I love Mac Dog. You know, he's he's awesome, and he was fun to travel with. Because you got to remember, like when you're filming with these guys, you're traveling with them, you're spending a lot of time with them, and they're like family. You know, and and you share a lot of neat moments with these guys. And Mac Dog is just a great dude, and he's funny, and he was fun to travel with. Yeah, that's rad. That's rad to hear. Of course, he's a little bit shy. He just did the bomb hole, which is a which is a big podcast. Yeah, and it's because he's relaunching Forum again with Jeremy Jones. So cool. they have a reason to go do it. And it sounds like you knew that your job was a job. You're one of the first or earliest, you know, super pro guys. Did you have a trick list that you wanted to get? Did you have a shot list from season to season where you're like, okay, like backflip off a big cliff. I want to try a five somewhere in the back country or, or a cab or five or something like that. Or, or was it kind of just show up for the shoot and whatever happens that day happens? Uh, not necessarily a shot list, but maybe in your head, a shot list, you know, like you're, you're always thinking about ways to progress cause you have to. Yeah. And that's a, one of the things I, I've shared with my wife um, and other people who have talked to me about my snowboard career was that like, you know, when you are professional for 14 years, there's pressure to go out and perform and do things bigger and better than you did the year before. And that's fun. And it's fun to chase that and it's fun to push it. But when the injuries come in there, mm. say you blow out your knee and you have to have ACL reconstruction and you, you're hobbling around for months, you know, and, and it's not six months until you're back to, you know, okay and charging that messes with your mind right and so like with with extreme athletes um each time you have a major injury to get over that becomes harder and harder so you're not like second guessing yourself and right. stuff like that you know and so um i loved my snowboard career but there was a lot of pressure you know there i used to tell people this th there's times where the weather might suck and you might not snowboard for three weeks. And then the next thing you know, it turns on and it's good to go. And you're standing on top of a 50 foot cliff and you haven't made a turn in three weeks. Wow. And, and now it's time to turn it on. Yeah. And so like that's intense, right? And yeah. so it's great to have the confidence to be able to step to stuff like that and not trip out on it, but it's heavy and it does wear on you, yeah. you know? Um, to do, to progress at your leisure is one thing. To think about like one or two things you want to try to do. But when you have to go put together a four minute piece for a snowboard movie, that's a lot of shots. That means like every time it's a bluebird day and the, the snow's good, you got to be on it and you got to be charging. And so it's, it's, it's intense, but 
But uh, I don't even know where this question. Where no, I this is great. About this this is incredible. Because like, yeah, we, as a consumer of that content, I got into my 40s before I realized how much work it was. Like to us watching you, you're a natural. You're out there. Every turn you make is perfect, and your four-minute part. We, we could imagine that you filmed that in a weekend. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you put your, if you were wearing the same gear to have some continuity in your part, we might think, you know, that guy's so good. He just, that was one of his days riding. You know, yeah. that he's over here, that he's over there. Yeah. But like, watching people struggle to get clips. Oh yeah. You know, like people working on two-year projects. Like Travis Rice was kind of the first guy to say. You know what? I want this movie to be badass. I'm going to take two years. It's going to take two. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing that he has the freedom to do that and the sponsors to, you know, have his back yeah. to say, yeah, we'll wait two years for something epic. The product had to be, yeah. you know, that's it. That's all. It's an amazing movie. I used movie. to have people ask me, like, so did you film that part in a day? Jesus. I'm like, no way, bro. I'm like, there's times where you might get one shot in a day. If you had a day where you got three shots that was an amazing day if you got one shot you were stoked yeah so if you got three shots like you were killing it yeah so you figure you know in a in a whole part you know maybe there's 60 shots so do the math i mean it's just like no it's it's many days and it's many perfect days because if the snow's not right and the sun's not out it's not going to look good and yeah. so you're not going to be able to go as big as you can and it's going to be in the shade and not going to it's not going to work. You did a couple of stunts. You were one of the first guys to do the stunts, like the the parachute shot, that huge clip, which was like, I don't know if I'm exaggerating to say shot of the year. Like, I think it was shot of the year. I think it was the thing that people were like, oh, wait until you see that rippy shot and the whatever it was, TV3 or whatever, TV4. Um, did I you see the shot? I think you're thinking about the snowmobile backflip. No, that was the next you're one. You're thinking about the, the base jump. The base jump. Which okay. one was first? Which one came first? The base jump came after. Oh, okay. Actually okay. doing okay. it on the snow. Yep. And that was with Slednecks. Oh, was and it? so I had gone... That was in a Slednecks movie? Yeah, that was for Slednecks. Wow, no and, way. And uh, the shot was actually mine because I actually paid to go, paid a filmer to go out there and film it and everything like that. And so... You owned the I, shot. That's I owned epic. the shot and I told hatchet that he could put it in in his movie you know because i wanted people to see it yeah because i was working on a project of my own that never ended up coming out oh no what was that well so i got dropped by burton and so it was like you know breaks on like i don't have any budget to do it right oh wow so yeah i started making this movie called uh ripley's believe it or not i love it and had a bunch of good shots for it and and but i didn't have hatchet behind it because he wasn't getting paid from Burton to, right. to film of course. it. And without the cash, you can't do it, you know? Oh, wow. And so that was unfortunate. But um, That is unfortunate. We should still do it. You got it in you to, <laughs> to film 60 shots. Yeah, let's go to Alaska. <laughs> so, um, so I did the backflip on the snowmobile, and then um, Slednecks, the, Jason Moriarty, yep. who started Slednecks. Yep. He, um, I don't remember how we were talking, but I, I, I had mentioned to him, I'd love to take a snowmobile off a big cliff somewhere and then turn it into a base jump, you know? And so he's like, okay. And so I went up to Canada. I found this, I went up to Canada to go try to find a cliff to launch off, right? Yeah. So I bought my old snowmobile back from Thin Air Motorsports in Truckee. They, he had bought my snowmobile for like two grand and he wanted to put it up in his shop because it was the one I had backflipped, right? Oh, right. So I said, hey man, can I buy the sled back from you? And I want to take it up to Canada to go do the snowmobile base jump. So I had a parachute for an ultra glide airplane that I had attached to the back of the snowmobile so that when I got off the snowmobile and opened my parachute, I would then deploy the parachute for the snowmobile. So find this cliff and it's not very big. It's like maybe it's maybe like a seven or eight hundred foot cliff, which seems big, but it's really not that big for a base jump. Yeah, right, it's not that right. big for a base jump. So I went off it, did a real slow backflip. Filmer and the photographer both missed the shot. No, I open up my parachute, no. my parachute cracks open, rips the back bar off my snowmobile. Snowmobile does like a 600 foot lawn dart. And they didn't get the footage of Missed this? the shot. No. So it sticks nose in and it like literally looked like a lightning bolt to my, the hull of the snowmobile. Like it crushed it like an aluminum can. 
So when it did the backflip, it stayed nose down and just went. And uh, we had to go up and like pull the snowmobile out and like be sure that all the parts were taken and we put them into a net. You know, a lot of people, the next year when I did it, we got it on film. So anyway, I did have one shot, okay? So I had one um, video camera shot that my buddy Miles Dasher shot from the side. So you see me go off the cliff, wah, you see me flipping and then I go out of frame. And so you're like, whoa, that was just like a 300 foot backflip on a snowmobile. Like, what did yeah. I just see? Yeah. So I sent it to Jason Moriarty and he looked at it and he goes, man, you know, that shot's gnarly and it's super rad, but like, instead of letting the cat out of the bag, how about next year we go back up to Canada, we go get two snowmobiles, film it out of the helicopter again and get the shot. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we went back up there, found a better cliff and I got to do it twice. And then that's what you saw was being was filmed wow. out of the helicopter. Wow. And the spot that I that, that we found or that I found um, was a beautiful cliff, probably about a thousand foot cliff, vertical, but it had barely any snow at the top of it. So I had to shovel snow to make just basically this runway that was the width of the snowmobile and maybe like 15 feet long and, oh, it, and oh, the oh. snowmobile is facing downhill and so at the edge of this cliff where I'm building this flat area to take off of I'm like standing on the edge so at some point I had like a rope and I was like pack having uh, somebody hold on to it packing down right on the edge of this thing Jesus. and then when it was time to do it I kind of messed up because I wanted to let the snowmobile warm up. But if you ever watch snowmobile racing, you'll notice that they will pull the ass end of the snowmobile up and they will give it a throttle, whop, 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 and they'll clear out basically the exhaust. And then they turn the snowmobile off. And then right before the race starts, they start it up, yadun, 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 and then they go. And so I had let my snowmobile warm up and someone mentioned something like, you know, it's my, probably going to bog if you do that. But I was thinking, well, the sled's got to be warm. Right. So it didn't really make sense to me. But got anyway, it. when I hit the throttle, it bogged. <laughs> and it was just like, <laughs> no. Oh. And I was going off the cliff going like, you know, four miles per hour or something. <laughs> no. And I'm just like, come on, baby, let's go, let's go, you know. And then once I got off the cliff, then the throttle being wide open cleared out wah, and it got it to flip yeah and then i could get off of the snowmobile track away for a while and then open up my parachute but i got to do that twice and um that was a fun stunt but it was it was pretty intense because of my short run in well you're talking about something that i don't think anyone would ever repeat that like that's gnarly so when and you're, you're, you're talking about it like you didn't even tie off at the top while you're patting it down like you don't have like a harness and a bunch of flat, stuff though it was it was all good <laughs> but it was exposed like you could stand on cliff. the edge and feel Come it, you know on. you could feel the exposure of it for sure yeah no you're very calm talking about this thing that is insane like it is nuts and that you had two snowmobiles lined up to do it in case the first one breaks the thing work, again yeah, yeah. They, they bought two junkers, yeah. so I think they paid like 2500 bucks, which is still a nice chunk of money yeah. uh, for each one of these sleds. Um, one, was a, one was a Polaris, an old Polaris powder special, and then the other one, um, then the other one was a, uh, I think it was like a, it was a triple. I think it was like a Yamaha triple or something like that. And it was a screamer like on the flats, Yeah. which I thought, cause I really wanted to do two flips. Oh wow. But um, it bogged on the takeoff too. Yeah. And so after one flip, it was like, it wasn't going anywhere. Cause I had already reached a high enough speed where the wind now was a factor. Sure. It was holding it and it wouldn't let it flip again. Cause both times I stayed on the snowmobile holding the throttle and it was like, it's not going anywhere. And then you can watch when I get off that snowmobile, it starts to helicopter because of the wind, oh. you know, going, going uh, that fast. The wind is just, you know, not your friend. So are you at any point in this, like scared for your life? Um, so when you do something like that, it happens really fast. So you just want to be like laser focused because, um, you, 
you're I I might have mentioned this to you before, but adrenaline's a funny thing. Like people say, like, oh, you must be an adrenaline junkie. No, I don't like the way adrenaline makes me feel. Because sometimes adrenaline can make you feel sick, it can make you feel nauseous. It's not a good thing when you feel too much of it. And so controlling it is 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 the key. Um, so when it's time to do something scary, sometimes you gotta slap yourself in the face and go like, okay, game time. Like it's I need to be focused and I have to remember that I'm doing this because I want to do this. No one's making me do this. This is going to be badass. Like this is awesome. This is what dreams are made of. Like enjoy this. You know what I mean? Because otherwise it'll go by so fast. It'll be done and you're like you don't really remember too much from it. You just remember like the feeling of it, maybe the wind speed or whatever, the takeoff, you know, little bits of it. So that's why I always love filming because it's like you can capture it on film, you can go back and, and enjoy it from your couch. <laughs> yeah. Versus when you're full of that adrenaline where it's like you're you're like a warrior. So like if you were going into battle, yeah. It's not time to let your adrenaline overtake you because you're either gonna like kill them or they're gonna kill you, right? And so that's kind of the way extreme sports are. Like you have to you have to rise up and go put your game face on. That's just so sick, dude. It's so, fun though. Yeah, yeah. It's you fun though, and it's so fun it. to share that with people. Yes. You know. Yes. And uh, I think there were times uh, in snowboarding where maybe I shared something with somebody, and it came off as arrogance or me bragging, but it wasn't. I just wanted to share something badass with someone who maybe would never get to experience it. And so my way of doing that was go and capture it on film and share it and the fact that you could make a living doing that being a show off and like being a daredevil like that's badass you know i basically got to live out a dream i mean even as a kid i was kind of like the kid that was you know hitting the bmx jump that i shouldn't have been hitting and skinning my knee and like eating it but i went big you know and then it was like onto a dirt bike and then catching big air on that or jumping huge into the water you know big cliff stuff like that so it's just been a slow progression and praise god i got to do that for a while so it's a personal progression yeah and but it's also you know at the time that you were doing it you were able to reach the edge of the progression of of a burgeoning new sport that everybody's this big thing that everybody's you know ex super excited about and it's making it in the news that oh ride's gone public you can make a million dollars if you buy stocks and snowboarding you know, I remember at the time, like, working at a shop, getting called to the radio station, like, what is snowboarding? You know, we're here to talk about the ski show that comes up this weekend, and a big part of it's going to be this snowboarding thing. And <laughs> just sitting there explaining that snowboarding is this alternative to skiing, and it's safe, and it's so fun, and you should try it, you know, and that momentum is behind you while you're going okay i'm going to take some crazy daredevil shit i did when i was a kid and turn it into like manly insane daredevil stuff so cool <laughs> yeah it was, it was a fun fun ride for sure who owned the footage the second time you did the sled stuff uh sled next so that sled next yeah because a lot of people don't understand this and why would they, they're not in it. I, I think even professional snowboarders don't know this. Like if I use a photo of you, right? Like a Google image, Jim Rippey. Yeah. I get the backflip photo. Who took the, the box photo for whatever it was, TV? Kiyoki flag. Yeah. So if I just use that and put it on my podcast, yeah. because I talk to you yeah. and you go, yeah, hey, use it. Sure. That's it, it, If you don't own it, I can't use it yeah. without permission from the person who owns it yep and the people who own it i think the the person whose fingers on the on the shutter is most times unless they were being paid by you know burton would would own all their stuff they would send out a, a staff photographer who had to i think they had to turn it into burton and then the burton marketing department would submit it to where it's going to go but most people these days on the internet that even run snowboarding media stuff, they're just asking permission from the rider. Like, hey, send us some photos that you like. You know, uh, maybe they're just taking a shortcut and, and making sure then the, then because if you called the photographer said, hey, is it cool if I give this to this guy? 
he's probably going to say yes, right? Yeah, maybe. Whereas if I call him, <laughs> at the end of the day, if if I get the photo from you and he calls me, where'd you get that? I'm like, oh, Jim, Jim, give it yeah. to me. But the, you know, so owning your footage, I mean, it's so tragic that it happened the way it happened. How did how did Burton break it to you that they're getting you off the team? Well, uh, you know, you'd mentioned kind of snowboarding exploding. Yeah. And so I got to ride that wave. Well, that ra wave crashed mm -hmm. um, after 9-11 happened. Our economy crashed. And so snowboarding is this fun thing that people spend extra money on. Now people didn't have extra money. So that market share that was gaining 20% every year wasn't. And so uh, Burton had gotten a new marketing manager and a new team manager, both from Europe. And so, you know, I was at the end of a three year deal and they were paying me a lot of money. So they basically called me to come back there to renegotiate my contract. And I went back there and they said, Hey, we're not going to renew your contract. And, uh, I said, all right, um, God bless you guys. And I got up and I walked out and I remember Tom McGann, who was the president of the company saying, Hey, I'll walk you out. And I was, he goes, you want me to walk you out? And I was like, no, I'm good. And I walked out of there and I just felt crushed, you know, cause oh. it's like, it's, it's, it was more than a job. Cause that was like friends and family and people that I'd spent, um, 14 years working on their products and going on trips with and now all of a sudden it's like that's it so it, it was hard but it's okay you know god's in control and um and he sustained me in that time and uh i remember when i when that happened i had actually planned a, this trip to go to this thing called the call to new york which was after 9 11 happened it was this Christian get together to pray for the nation. And so, uh, like maybe four or five people that I know from like the Truckee Tahoe area that I went to this Bible study with, we were all going to go to the call to New York. So I get dropped. I jump on a little commuter plane and I go to New York and, um, and I land there and I go to this event and we're out on this lawn um, in the stadium. And the, the thing was, everyone was going to fast for the entire day. So eat nothing. So I'm sitting there. I just got dropped by my sponsor. Oof. My mind's going a million miles per hour. And this person comes out and starts to worship, starts to sing praises to the Lord. And I remember just kind of trying to press in and I'm just like, Lord, I don't understand why this is happening to me but um, just would you please help me? And the Lord, just kind of a wave of the Holy Spirit just came over me like a warm blanket. And the Lord just spoke to my heart and said, you know, it's okay. It's all right. I wish you would have said, go to another team. Like you should have got another sponsor or were you well, done at so, that so point? So here's the deal. Like I did try that. Okay. And so I rode for another season mm -hmm. without Burton. Yeah. And one day I went out filming and I was going to, I was going to film with someone from standard films who didn't have to film me anymore because I don't ride for Burton and Burton's paying them right to film Burton riders. So he said, you know what, Rippy, I'll, I'll film you. So we went out of the back country and we went to this area that had some cool lines and I was starting to look, look at different things and trying to figure out something I wanted to do. And there was a couple younger riders there that day and they were trying to do some stuff and they did a couple lines and didn't really get any shots. And I was sitting there on my snowmobile by myself and the Lord spoke to my heart as clear as day. And he said, you've been there and you've done that. And now it's time to let it go. Wow. And I went, okay, Lord, I'll let it go. But if, if I let it go, you have to take away my desire to do it. And that was my prayer went to dinner with my wife that night and um, told her, I said, I'm done snowboarding. She goes, what do you mean? I said, the Lord told me today that it's time to let it go. And, uh, 
and I just started crying because it's like that was what I did for you know 15 years of Your my identity, life. Yeah, right. and part of my identity was wrapped up in that. But God was saying, I got a new identity for you. It's not snowboarding. It's being a follower of me yeah. and I'm going to lead you through some tough times. I'm going to strip you of everything that you have to teach you things that you can't learn any other way. Wow. So I went from making a lot of money to making no money, Yeah. you know, and going like, okay, what am I going to do now? And you know, I got a child on the way and like, you know, um, the timing was challenging and, uh, <clears throat> so it's all good. God's been good. And he's led me to do some jobs I would have never done had I not been in snowboarding. You know, I, I was a youth pastor for four years, um, worked at a gold mine. And then I got a job as a correctional officer and I've been there for eight years. And that's really been a ministry for me to go in there and share the gospel with men who are broken. And so pretty much every day I go to work, I see little things that God does and God wanted me out of prison. Jeez. So, you know, literally talking yeah. about a trial, yeah. like, you know, my existence now is spending five days a week out of prison and ministering to inmates and, Jeez. and correctional officers. And, um, you know, I'm not the popular guy. Like, I think I might've told you this before, but like, you know, in corrections, there's two different philosophies, two major philosophies. Yes. One, treat a person bad because yeah. they're dirt yes. and they need to learn their lesson. Right. And then my philosophy is you need to show some person how to act right. You need to show a person what manners looks like. Um, I try to live by the golden rule the best I can. The Holy Spirit helps me to do it to treat people like I want to be treated. So I don't treat these inmates like dirt. I treat them like any other human being that I would come across. And you know, if they uh, are disrespectful or they break the rules, trust me, I'll get in their face and let them know, Hey, here's, here's your options. You know, if you're refusing to do what I'm asking you to do right now, I can find a new bed for you. It's going to be in a, in a cell and you probably don't want to lose the freedoms you have right now living in this sweet unit. You know what I mean? So sure. I'll just reason with them, even in having to discipline them. Most of the time, God gives me some empathy and compassion towards them. There's been a few times I've lost my temper. I can't lie. You know, sometimes you fight stupid with stupid, right? You know, right. and you can go there right. and at the end I get convicted about it. Yeah. I remember asking an inmate to do something in this one unit and he wouldn't do what I wanted him to do. And I sat him down away from all the other inmates. And I just said, Hey bro, just so you know, if you refuse an order from me, I'm going to find a new place for you to live. You're going to lose everything that you have. It's your choice, but you're refusing a direct order. Yeah. I told these guys in the unit, I wanted them up on their bunks because I had to count this unit with 140 inmates in it and I'm there by myself. Yeah. And so Jeez. guys in the guys in the bunks, I want you in your bunks because they'll stand out in front of their bunks and it makes it very difficult to count. And if you mess up your count, it can become a big deal. Yeah. And so I said, Hey, if you're in the, in the bunks, I want you in your bunks. When I do count, come around this guy standing out in front of his bunks. So I didn't school him in front of everybody else. Cause once again, I'm going to treat him like I want to be treated for the most part. So anyway, I finished my count, bring him aside, and I lost it on him. I didn't come off calm. I, I said, I don't know what the F you're thinking, I cussed, yeah. which I normally don't do. I said, I don't know what the F you're thinking. If I give you a direct order, you do it. That's all there is to it. It's really simple. And so um, he started saying some stuff, and then I kind of rebuttaled him and like shut him down. And then that night, I got really convicted about it the Lord was convicting me that I could have handled that better. So that a couple days later, I ended up in that same unit and I found that guy I said, Hey, can I talk to you? Pulled him aside and I said, Hey, I lost my cool with you the other night. I cussed. I'm a Christian. I try not to do that. And I don't, I, I misrepresented God by the way I acted towards you. Wow. Will you forgive me? And he goes, you know what? I've been down for, I can't remember how many years he said, I think he said like 21 years or something like that. You know what, CEO? I've been down for 21 years and you're, I've never been apologized to. 
and I'm the one who should be apologizing. I'm the one who blew it yesterday. I am so sorry and thank you so much for coming and talking to me. And so I was able to kind of turn it, yeah. but I lost it on yeah. them, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I blow it sometimes. That's inspiring, dude, that you're doing, like when you said that you were a corrections officer in a jail, I was like, I don't see how that works. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know you. Prison. <laughs> I don't know you, Yeah. Uh, but I feel like we got to know a bit of your personality over those 14 years and video parts and interviews in magazines and even talking to you over the phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, on some level when you were talking about working in a mine, like we're, you were doing the, you know, like shoveling rocks. You're like for 12 hours straight. We're talking about under belts, really like, yeah. insanely hard work. Yeah. You being a celebrity to me that was making a lot of money mm -hmm. in the 90s, I, w I would have hoped that you wouldn't have to go through that. But then hearing your story, I'm like, you're following your calling and the world needs people like you in positions like where you are right now. Yeah, it's a dark place. It's a dark place. Yeah, and what, what And it's not place? designed to, to punish people physically and emotionally and mentally. It's, it's designed on principle mm -hmm. to rehabilitate people. You don't want to have someone that's perpetually stuck in jail. You want to believe that people make mistakes in their life. And some of those mistakes are circumstantial. If you look at the demographic of who's in jail, yeah. you're more likely to be poor and black. Absolutely. Than anything like any other determining factor you know what i mean genetics sure. or any of that kind of stuff Your folks are on drugs right what kind of parents are they going to be if they're hooked on drugs so do those people deserve to be punished more than they already were punished from their upbringing i don't think yeah so. you're gonna yell at them and beat them up why like, do you think that what do you what do you that's, think that's what gonna got teach them, them there in the first yeah. place and here's the thing like <clears throat> when you work in a prison you have you know some inmates that have mental illness and stuff like that like, you know, you have to keep your guard up because someone could act a fool and like take a swing at you, you know, and you're like watching for that and stuff. But like, um, you learn, uh, you learn how to bob and weave. And I've been there for eight years and I've never had a use of force. I've never had to take somebody to the ground, but I'm not saying that won't happen tomorrow I hear when you. I go there because no, someone's acting a fool. I'll tell you something interesting that you'll find this interesting about the, um, Actually, you know what? I, I shouldn't say it. So we have this weird thing working for a prison that they don't really want us to talk to media about uh, like what happens in of there. Of course. But, but I've gone through some pretty crazy stuff uh, doing this job. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't even... I understand. Yeah, it's all I good. Understand. I'll tell you when we're off, when we're off, yes, off the mic. Yeah, I was, my next question was actually kind of like I've listened to a lot of podcasts about corrections officers and corruption. There's a lot of corruption. There is. And so it's a dirty place. I'm imagining that you are, uh, like, I can't even imagine how do you have the integrity to go up against if the, if you're in a place where corruption is the kind of status the norm. quo. Yeah. Right. It's right. It's the norm. Right. You ever heard that, that uh, saying, <clears throat> no good deed goes unpunished. unpunished. Yeah. What the hell does that even mean? Here's what it means. We live in a sinful fallen world. And if you are nice in a place where people aren't, you think that they're going to like you. I treat everyone the way I'd want to be treated. Hey, how you doing? You know, whatever, whatever. Um, you know, I'm not going to over talk to somebody who I can tell doesn't want to talk, right. but I'm going to say hello to them, you know, and treat them like a human being. Right. And you would not never think that if you were kind, people would dislike you. But I have people that straight up hate me. Yeah. You know, I got but you. then I think about my Lord. I yeah. think about Jesus who all he did was bless people and they crucified him. Right. And he said, if you follow me, they hated me. They're going to hate you too. Mm. Mm. So, you know, when it happens, it's yeah. like, thank you, Lord. Your word is true. As hard as it is to swallow that. Sure. It's true. No good deed goes unpunished. What does that mean? Yeah. It means that you think if you do something good, something good's going to happen to you. Mm. No, because we're in a broken, fallen world and we deal with human beings who are sinners. Wow. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I've really gone away from 
like I grew up in the Christian church in the United Church and at 18 uh, I went through a confirmation process huh. and the minister of the church came in after the confirmation class was you know we're about to be confirmed in front of our congregation and he said do you know what this means this means you are now an adult uh, an adult member of the church so you're not here as a guest of your family anymore you're not here because your parents go here you're now here of your own choice and I, the wheels in my head start turning. The next Sunday, my mom comes to get me for church, and I go, nah, I choose not to today. And I never went back, because I didn't see, I didn't see the bigger picture like what you're talking about. Like, I didn't have it in me to put the kind of effort. I I saw the truth of of the words that like like the goodness of the Christian faith. Like, but I didn't see it in practice in the congregation. I still saw the pettiness. I still saw that they, these were people, um, and no offense to anyone that was going to church. Really, probably I was weighing it against partying, which, you know, Sunday morning's valuable real estate for, for a kid in their teens, right? Yeah. Um, but lately I've been finding, like we started with me saying the Jack and the Beanstalk story. I've yeah. been finding the wisdom in the metaphors of the Christian Bible stories. And I think it's cool. I'm not going to church again. That's just not my MO. Um, But there's obviously something there and you've articulated it really wonderfully here today. Like, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think about the Bible, they think that it's a book that teaches you about moral living, but it's not. It's a book that says you're a dirty, rotten sinner in need of a savior. Right. And you can't be good enough, no matter how hard you try, right. to stand before a holy God who is unable to sin. Because we sin without even trying. Right. You know, the story of the Bible is a story of a savior who's brought into the world to live the sinless life we can't live and to ultimately be pinned to a cross and die a criminal's death. And right. while he's hanging there bleeding out, he says, God, forgive them. They know not what they do. Or right. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Why? Because they're sinners. But then when Jesus comes back, he says, you must be born again to inherit the kingdom of God. You must accept what I did and accept me as your Lord and Savior. And that's what makes you right before God in heaven. Oh, interesting. Not your good deeds because you can't be good enough. The scripture actually says your good deeds are like filthy rags before God. Wow. Because you're still a sinner in your sin, right? Got it. So um, your debt was paid. I kind of give people this example. Like if you were standing in a court of law and you owed $10,000 to be released, your bail was $10,000. And and someone who came in had $10,000 and said, I will pay his bail. The judge who's a just judge, would take the $10,000 and release you. It doesn't make you innocent. It just means your bail's been paid. <laughs> That's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He paid our bail. Right. So it doesn't make me perfect, but here's the thing. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit of the living God is dwelling in you, and he changes you. There's that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Veil's taken off. Oh my gosh. You're real. That happened to me at the age of 30, sitting in a church by myself, went going to check it out, and God saved me that day. And so now I'm 40 or now I'm 52, just turned 52. So I've been, you know, walking with the Lord for 22 years. It's him and only him living in you that changes you. There's a lot of people who say they're Christians who don't know the Lord. They know about him. It'd be like the difference between me saying, like, um, I know who President Trump is, or he's not the president now. Sure. I know who President Biden is. That's different than me saying, I know President Biden. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I Way got different, you. right? I got you. Way, so it's a yeah. personal relationship because he's actually living in you now. Yeah. Because otherwise, I'd be working out of prison feeling sorry for myself. 
but yeah. I know that he's the one who's who's opening doors and closing doors and steering me where he wants me to go, even if it's in the mundaneness of just making a paycheck. Right. Even in the mundaneness of working at a gold mine. Right. Whatever it may be, Lord, I'm gonna go scrub. I, I was cleaning houses up in Tahoe for a while, scrubbing toilets for Jesus, but I know that my heavenly father knows what's best for me and I need to do that. Sick. To learn something that I can't learn any other way, I just need to trust him. I'm convinced that you're convinced, 100%. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've taken a different path for sure, and I've found a few of the same comforts in the universe. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, that I feel like me, God, it, I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect where you're at because where you're at is very inspiring. And I'm, sh I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are people that are Christian that are going to watch this that are going to just be jumping for joy. And there are people that are anti-Christian. Oh, they'll think I've lost my mind. That are going to think you lost your mind. And I, if there's anything this show has given me, it's the ability to talk to people all over the place. Yeah. And the real blessing for me is just having the common sense to meet where we agree, yeah. right? Instead of arguing about where we're, we've are we dug in and we're like, this can't be real because of this and this and this, right? Like, I'm not going to tell you, you know, the things that brought me away from it because that's irrelevant to your journey, right? But It's not, though. Right, right. I, I gain from it. Right, right. So, so Can uh, I tell you then? I'll tell you what, what basically where I'm at. Sure. <laughs> I did a lot of psychedelics. So psychedelics are very, you know, changing in your brain, right? Like we, yeah. you talked about adrenaline. There, there are really three types of drugs in the world. There are uppers, downers, and changers. Yeah. Uppers are coffee to Coke, meth, all those things that get your heart racing. Yeah. Downers, obviously, you've got your heroin, you've got, and everything in between, mm -hmm. you know, Tylenol three. And those are your downers, mm -hmm. sleeping pills, that kind of stuff. And the changers are these weird things. Marijuana is a, a bit of a changer, um, but like the big ones, like dimethyltryptamine, DMT, 5-MeO, people call that the toad. These take you out of your conscious life and bring you to a place that is so bizarre and so foreign that where I've landed is that God is weird, okay? For me, personally. Not a, not a, a masculine, patriarch in the sky okay but weird like okay. weird when i see you know bugs in a bird that's been hit by a car and it makes you go whoa it's weird like but then also love also hate everything god has to be able to be everything because there's nothing that god can't be so i see weird god for me weird god is really inspiring how weird is this conversation that beside a river it's it's just everything is so weird and wild and so when i would take these really strong psychedelics and go to this place it felt like and this sounds crazy that i was having a conversation with god okay the way that i'm having a conversation with you okay and the knowledge that I've brought back from that place, which is just for me, is that this life is incredibly special. It's really rare and it's really wild that in all the coincidences in the world, my parents got together and made me. And while I'm here, the job is to experience and experience everything that there is to experience the highs and the lows and the everything so in the same way that you can do really difficult jobs and still maintain a positive outlook i feel a positive outlook now in difficult situations where i'm like this is just a spike this is a feeling that i'm having that is a human feeling that is a part of being a human being and it's allowed me to accept other people that are having human feelings. I used to be in a big resistance. Like, it can't be like this. My mom can't act like that. You know, this boss can't tell me this. This line at this bank shouldn't be this long. Why is that guy at the front old and he doesn't know what he's doing? He can't go to a bank machine. These people should, shouldn't be here. Like, there was a resistance to everything. And once I realized well, that old guy at the front of the line is you know he's lived a human life he's doing a human thing it's completely acceptable 
for a bank to have a line. That's normal. I have to just realize that at that point, once everything became acceptable, I got to choose how I react to things. And before that, I was just reacting based on, I don't know, old strategies and things that had worked in the past. And so I've, I've found a, a comfort and a happiness with life that when you were talking about your philosophy mm -hmm. and I, it, that I see in your eyes that you're genuine, that it's actually, it's, it's put you on the right path. It's kept you on the right path for ever since it happened. And that's rad. Um, so to go along with your train of thinking, everything you say, everything is right, right? But there are some things that are wrong and we can see the dysfunction and brokenness in this world. We can look at law, for instance. Yes. And we can see, like we can look at a judge and a judge's job is to listen to people's cases and rule towards what's right and what's wrong. So the Bible says that God's put a conscience in you. That word conscience sim simply means with knowledge. So if you steal from somebody else, you know instinctively that it's wrong. So like when you watch a child and it says, don't touch wet paint, they go and touch it. <laughs> right. They know that's wrong, but they, they still do it, okay? So, um, the Bible says that there is a God of this world and his name is Satan. The Bible says that a third of the angels from heaven came down and are with Satan on his mission. His mission is to take as many with him to hell as possible. Because when his time is done here, it's done. Now, when you take your last breath, you're going to stand before God on judgment day. And you're going to either be in his son and be forgiven, or you're gonna be held accountable for your sin. Just like standing before a judge who, if he's a good judge, he's gonna hold you accountable for what you've done wrong, yes. right? That's yes. what a good judge, a just judge does. So you mentioned drugs, okay? When the Bible talks about drugs, it uses this word pharmakia. It's where we get our, it's, it's a Latin word where we get our word pharmacy from. Yeah. Well, the Bible transcribes that word also as witchcraft. So when you do psychedelics, mm -hmm. you're opening up this door to demonic forces to help you do bad stuff or just make you discount the fact that God is real. Okay. So Satan's job is to make you indifferent right. towards God's reality. Right. Because if he makes you indifferent, he makes you numb with Novocaine. And Novocaine makes you not feel anything. Right. He's going to numb you right into hell. So you spend eternity with him there forever because he doesn't want you to know about. Now, here's the thing. You know the truth that Christ died on the cross to pay the debt for your sin. But he's got you in a place now where you're just choosing not to believe that. Right. So this is scary because you're numb. Um, I did a bunch of psychedelics, too. But in that... I found a lot of meaninglessness, mm. you know, mm -hmm. I've done mushrooms and acid and stuff like that. And, you know, went and cross country skied and tripped out on the way things looked and, yeah, and felt weird. And, you know, I've done that whole thing. Yeah. But when I came to Christ, God started convicting me about smoking weed because I was a weed smoker at the time. Yeah. And so I quit for a year and I went back to it and I quit for a year again and, and went back to it. And the second time I went back to it, I went to this little non-denominational, actually it was like a, Pente not Pentecostal, a charismatic church got in you. Kings Beach. Okay, so I go to this little church and it's got a guest speaker that week. And it was this black pastor who brought his worship team with him, a bunch of black ladies. And they're in this little church that was like a converted garage. And they were praising God and it was really awesome. So he starts preaching. And he said, I got a word of knowledge for somebody. Someone in here has this sin that you've been avoiding for a while, but you're thinking about taking it back. And I was like 10 months of not smoking weed the second time around. Yeah. And he goes, someone in here, you got this sin <clears throat> you've been putting off for a while, but you're thinking about it again. And God wants you to know that you can have it if you want it. But he came to give you freedom. And as long as you choose it, you're not going to be free because you're bound by that substance. 
And he literally said that. And I'm wow. sitting in the back of the church like, <laughs> okay, that was for me. But guess what? I still went back to it. Oh, wow. Because I was addicted to smoking marijuana. Yeah. So after I went back to it for like a month, I told my wife one night, I said, you know what? I can't quit this. I'm fully addicted to it. Will you pray with me? And she said, absolutely. So we got on our knees in the kitchen on the floor. And I said, Lord, you've shown me clearly that I'm a prisoner to this substance wow. and I want you to take it from me and I never want it back. I want you to do whatever it takes to make me disgusted by it. If I see people smoking it, make it smell like dog poop. Do whatever you got to do to make me never smoke it again, Lord. I want to have freedom in you. And I said, I gave it to him. He took it. Never, haven't smoked weed for, you know, like 15 years or however long it's been. I'd have to look it up. I think it's like 17 years or something. That's incredible. I did the same thing. Cold without, turkey, no problem. Yeah, he took it. Bam. He took away the desire to do it. Did the same thing with alcohol because I'd get off work and I'd think like, what do you want to drink? You know, let's go by the Mavericks and grab a 24 ounce beer. Sure. I didn't want to hear that voice anymore. Right. So I decided I'm going to quit drinking too because, you know, uh, drinking around people can be a stumbling block for them as well. And it's just, I don't have it around my son at all. So my yeah. wife doesn't drink either. So we have no alcohol around my son. And I think that's wise because it's playing with fire. So I know you're freezing right now because it's am. cold. You can see it. It's cold, <laughs> but, but I appreciate you and yeah. I appreciate your journey. But I'm sitting before you right now because God has me sitting before you and he loves you hey, more thanks. than you can ever comprehend. He loves you so much that he would die in your place to save you. Satan doesn't want that. Right. And he's going to do everything he can to make you indifferent towards God so that you take your last breath not knowing Christ. That's scary. I really, really need to say genuinely from my heart that I, I appreciate you. Thank you. And, and your honesty and your integrity in your beliefs, man. Thank and you. And uh, having me in your home is like next level for me. Like I, I'm really honored. Right on. And that conversation, <laughs> you know, that's heavy. This is really heavy. We're talking about eternity here. Yeah. We're talking about. We are. This is this is the most important thing. So I understand completely. I th I mean I understand as much as one person can understand another. The gravity of it. The yeah. gravity and and the intensity and the intention behind your words. Yeah. It's beautiful and it's it's loving and I and I appreciate it. Right on. And I, 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 I just know it, it helps me understand a lot about, you know, the fact that you've got to be an incredible dad. How old is your how old is your son? He's 14, 14. Yeah. So that's a long journey. Right. The, the, and those challenges are real. Yeah. The very it, probably the most difficult thing that I've taken on. So when my kid was 14, he stole weed from me. I just had recreational weed around the house. Yeah. And the listeners of the show have heard this. It's, it's worth repeating because when I found out, I called him. He was at school. We've got phones now, so you yeah. can just call your kid in class, which is insane. Yeah. He ducks out of class. He goes, what's up, Dad? I go, I, I, I know that you took some weed. And he melts down. He's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to take all that money, you know, like, and I'm like, money, money. <laughs> what? I'm like, where are you? And he's like, I'm just in the cafeteria. I'm like, I will be there in five minutes. And when I got there, he confessed that the five minutes was the longest five minutes of his life. Yeah. He was afraid because what I'd said to him was, you know, that's not my money. I owe that money to other people. Like, and so then he, he was thinking, oh my God. My dad's going to get shot. Like, that's exactly <laughs> the first place his mind went. Yeah. So then I get there and I gave him such a humongous hug and just held him in my arms. And I was so happy to have him back because he'd been distant because he felt bad. Yeah. So he had been avoiding me. Yes. I thought he would just hang out with kids being 14. Yeah. Uh, because I was distant from my kid, my parents when I was 14 for sure. I thought that was normal. But holding him again, and it was like that the story of the prodigal son. It yeah. was like, he's like, come I, 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 am I in trouble? I, I was like, you're me. not in trouble at all. Yeah. There's zero trouble here. Yeah. I had weed in a house with a 14-year-old. I, I, I need to apologize to you. I, I had money just sitting there tempting you, getting you... Like, and, and every time you take some, you feel worse and worse about yourself. I know how you feel yeah. and I love you. And I'm so glad 
that we've had this opportunity to connect on this level. That's super cool. Yeah, and that that story for me really, um, you know, like there's nothing more. You, important you have than a my gentle kids. heart. Yes, absolutely. And that's, and that's rare. So you disciplined your son out of love, and you didn't even really discipline him. You <laughs> yeah. just you disciplined him by the pain he saw in you. That's right. And I actually also connected with him on a level that I'm like, there are temptations out there, absolutely. And you have to make choices. Yep. And your choices have consequences. And I would say to him, look, imagine what would have happened had you never gotten caught and you just felt bad about me and about the situation. Yeah. And there was some sort of wedge between us that we never healed. A lot of dads have that with their kids. They just can't connect. Mm -hmm. But instead, we've taken a negative and we've turned it into a positive. Awesome. And so, like, he's 19 now. He chose to stop smoking weed. He did, And he... It's it's legal in Canada, so it's a kind of a different it's animal, here too, yeah. right? Oh, right. So it's <laughs> like now we have real conversations about, you know, what are the effects? Your your young mind is not scientifically it's not, it's not good for kids. Same, yeah. yeah, and he chose not to, and he said, you know what? I'll reevaluate when I'm the age of majority, where I'm allowed to smoke it, and he doesn't. It's just not it. He's focused and supported i think that's the biggest thing is that he knows that whatever choices he makes he's accountable to me to him to his family to yeah. the future yeah yeah so that's a i mean i know you're going through I, I don't know if you're going through anything with your kid but i know from this conversation obviously you're raising a great kid and uh you're living a great life dude Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much for being on the show. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Oh. God bless you, bro. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Evan Rad. Shout outs this week to Jim, Jennifer, and Joby Rippy. Thanks so much for having me in your home. That was really awesome. The Grouse Park Season Ender Jam will be April 15th from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And I'm going to be on the mic as an MC. It's presented by Salmon Arms, 32, Dragon, Nitro, Boardroom, sandbox and air hole so if you're around vancouver april 15th make sure you come up can't believe the season's already winding down it seems like it just got started thanks to all of you listeners out there listening right to the end and be sure to come back next week for another episode of the effenrad snowboard podcast presented by vans and brought to you by effenrad snowboarding